God, we know that your spirit is alive and among us. So God, we pray that your spirit would open us up, open our ears and our eyes, our hearts and our minds, so that we might hear a word from you. And God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading is from the book of Deuteronomy. It's chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Listen for the word of God. When the Lord your God has brought you into the land that he swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you, a land with fine, large cities that you did not build, houses filled with all sorts of goods that you did not fill, hewn cisterns that you did not hew, vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And when you have eaten your fill, take care that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Nearly all forests contain trees called mother trees. They tend to be among the oldest in the forest, elder stateswomen, if you will, and they're called mother trees because of the ways in which they nurture the young. I didn't yet know the term, but I first encountered mother trees as a teenager on our farm in northern Michigan. A balsam fir tree that was 60 or 70 years old had grown to be 60 or 70 feet tall. Her branches spread far and wide. And for decades, she had been producing cones filled with seeds that each season would fall to the ground or be carried away by squirrels and birds. And now, for hundreds of feet in each direction, there are balsam trees of various sizes that have taken root from her seeds, all reaching skyward, growing about one foot per year. On the florist floor around her, you'll see the smallest, the newest seedlings, her shade protecting them from the hot summer sun, her branches shielding them from the heavy winter snow. In recent years, researchers have discovered that mother trees are doing even more to nurture the forest around them than we can see. Underneath the earth, the forest root system is interconnected and intertwined by a fungal network. A fungal network through which mother trees can identify, even communicate with other trees. For example, a single elder Douglas fir tree can be connected to hundreds of other trees, both of her species and of other species. And the coolest part is that these mother trees through this fungal network can tell which trees are in need of phosphates or nitrogen or some other such thing and, and then send them what they need. And the tree, the young tree that is in the most need, will receive the most from the mother tree. The forest then is full of trees that owe their existence that owe their flourishing to the mothers and the fathers and the ones who came before. In our scripture story this morning, God is preparing the Israelites for the day that God will bring them into the promised land. For 40 years, they'd been wandering through the wilderness, unsettled, uncertain, each day learning to depend on God for everything they need. And no surprise, in that wilderness, God does every day provide everything they need. Most of us have had that experience, I think. A wilderness season, a time when things were really hard, when our best efforts weren't enough, when it became clear that our own resourcefulness just wouldn't cut it. And we rarely look back fondly on those wilderness times. But when we look back on the wilderness times, we learn that those are the days that we learned to trust God. In the wilderness, we learn that every day God really does provide everything we need. When times are good, though, when interest rates are low and the price of oil is high, 
When love comes easy and the children listen the first time you tell them, when you win the game and the people cheer, when your health is good and the job is great, well, we quickly forget who is the source of our success. Our hard, our hard work matters, yes. But it's also easy to put a little too much stock in our own brains and brawn. It's easy to assume a little too quickly that our strength has come solely from within, perhaps forgetting the mothers, the fathers, the ones who came before, perhaps forgetting even God, the one who was and is and always will be. Thus, our scripture story. God is about to bring the people into a land flowing with milk and honey, a land full of everything they need. And God knows. God knows how quickly they will forget. How quickly they'll begin to look at their beautiful cities and fruitful fields and say, look at all we have done for ourselves God knows how quickly they will look at their uh, good and strong and safe and successful lives and say, look at what we have built all by ourselves. Forgetting the mothers, the fathers, the ones who came before, forgetting even God who promised and provided it all in the first place. As the people entered the promised land, the danger is not that they won't have enough. The danger is not the enemies they will face. The danger is that they will forget. That they will forget who is the source of their success. And so God reminds them, you, you are about to enter into a land with fine large cities that you did not build. You will live in houses full of all sorts of goods that you did not fill. You'll drink from hewn cisterns that you did not hew. You will eat from trees that you did not plant. It's my fourth Sunday here at Memorial Drive, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately. As I preach in a pulpit that I didn't build and worship in a church that I didn't fill, just two of the many ways that I am enjoying that I am benefiting from the work of those who came before. A few months ago at an annual conference, the yearly gathering of United Methodists in our region, I walked into opening worship after what had been a few whirlwind weeks in my own life. I was tired, distracted. I'd been paying no attention to the details of annual conference. Sorry, district superintendent. Uh, I didn't even know. I didn't know that when I walked into opening worship that I would see a stage overflowing with the choir and the orchestra of Memorial Drive United Methodist Church. And I ended up sitting in the second row behind some MDUMC people that I had already known, and they said, this is our church. And if you weren't there, I need you to know that our musicians filled that room with music that made me say, wow. And they filled that place with worship that made us think, it is well with my soul. Our church came to play that day, and so did this guy. I don't know if you can see from where you are, that's the Reverend Dr. Eugene Craig sitting there. He's something of a father tree in this place. He was senior pastor here for 26 years, sowing seeds that have now spread far and wide. Countless Christians were nurtured, mentored, counseled, and cared for underneath his branches. And I'm not sure if you could tell in that picture, but Dr. Craig is serving communion to me providing God's nourishment to me, somebody who was just a baby when he was pastor in this place. Dr. Craig had something to say to everyone he served that evening. Something like, I'm so happy to see you. God loves you so much. It's been a long time. How's your mom doing? And these short conversations made communion take a little bit longer than it normally does. But now, looking back on it all, all I can think is, don't forget. 
don't forget. Don't forget the mothers, the fathers, the ones who came before. When you stand in soaring sanctuaries that you didn't build, when you listen to beautiful music that you didn't make, don't forget the Lord. Don't forget the Lord our God, the one who brought us here in the first place. We're in the middle of a series on trees here in worship. Week one was Psalm 1. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. It's an invitation, it's a, a call to become deeply rooted in the word of God, to have ongoing continual encounters with God through scripture. And week two was the story of Zacchaeus. And what made the difference in Zacchaeus' life was that he made himself available to God. He made himself available to Jesus. He let himself be led by the Lord. But do you remember? Do you remember what allowed Zacchaeus to see Jesus in the first place? It was a tree, a sycamore tree. He climbed up so that he could see Today's story reminds us that our world is full of trees that we didn't plant. Trees that grew tall and strong and fruitful before we were ever born. Trees that in their maturity provide us with food and shade and homes and healing. All sorts of things that benefit us, but that we didn't produce. And the call throughout this series, the challenge throughout this series is simple. Be like trees. Be Psalm 1 trees rooted in God's love, nourished by God's word. Be like Zacchaeus' sycamore tree. Grow where God has planted you so that because of you, someone else will see Jesus. And today, today I challenge you to become like the trees that you didn't plant. Become like the mother trees and the father trees that have nurtured and nourished you. Become the people who provide food and shade and homes and healing for the ones who come after us, even long after us. Now, here's the thing. It won't happen by accident. We look at forests, we think about trees, and, it, and it's like they just happen. I know that there's science stuff that explains how they grow and what they need, but, but trees don't have to decide anything. It just happens. They just grow. That won't work for us. Not if we want to be God's faithful people in God's good world. We have to decide and we have to do. You, you have to decide that you are going to be rooted in God's love and nourished by God's word. And then you have to do. You have to act on it by, by reading your Bible, by seeking ongoing encounters with God through Scripture. You have to decide that you're going to help others see Jesus. And then you have to do. You have to act on it by fixing your own eyes on Jesus to see how he lives and how he loves so that you can do the same. I was asking around about our church's history the other day, looking for old photos and things like that. Reverend Jim McPhail went searching and found some things. So did several others of you, actually. And this is one of the things that Jim brought me. On the cover, it says, Schematic Presentation for Memorial Drive United Methodist Church. It's signed at the top. You want to guess whose signature is there? H. Eugene Craig of all people, a tree we didn't plant. And inside this booklet are draft blueprints for this sanctuary. This church is here because a lot of people came before us. But they didn't just come and sit. They didn't just come and sing. Now they did come and sit and they did come and sing. But they also decided and did. They made a plan and they built for the future. It wasn't just for us. I know that they also wanted to worship God in a beautiful sanctuary. They decided and they did. And because they did it, we now prosper. And it's a lovely thing about life. No matter how much we've done, someone else has come before us. No matter how much we will do, someone else will come after us. If we're going to be like those trees we didn't plant... 
like the mother and father trees who came before us, we have to decide it and do it, to make a plan and build a future. You know, the indigenous tribes of northeastern North America, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy is what they're called, they operate on uh, what they refer to as the seventh generation principle. Their philosophy is that in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. I stand here today so hopeful for the future of this church, so honored that I get to be a part of it, so excited to see what God will do with us. And it's with that same lens that we will become the people who provide food and shade and homes and healings for the people who come after us. With every decision we make, we will consider the impact of our decision on the seven generations to follow. And that will take a lot of thinking. It will take a lot of work. I have no doubt about that. Lots of planning and building and deciding and doing. And I pray that because we do it, People who haven't yet been born will prosper. You see, the future is also full of trees that we didn't plant. Seven generations from now, we'll all be gone. But God, let's not forget God who was and is and always will be planting trees that provide food and shade and homes and healing for this world that God loves. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let all God's people say, amen.